Welcome back. Chapter 11, finally we get to product. Life insurance. Life insurance. All right. So the purpose of life insurance, the primary purpose, not the purpose, because there are several purposes for life insurance. One is estate planning. But this is the primary purpose to replace income and wealth lost due to premature death. Death that happens before you expect it to happen. Statistically. Okay. Alright, so premature death can also be defined as death of a family head. The, important, the importance of family head means the most significant contributor financially. To the family. Of that, when the family has outstanding financial, still has outstanding financial obligations, like a mortgage or child care expenses or spousal support. So the head of the household dies and still has young children that are dependent or has a spouse that hasn't worked. Okay. Obviously, the loss of the income can cause serious financial problems. And the loss of benefits as well. Okay, so if your health insurance is through your business, through your work, and one spouse works and the other spouse doesn't, and one spouse dies, you lose your health coverage. And this happened to a client of mine. Her husband was the president of an organization, and that organization started a health insurance program for cities. He started it, and it was huge. And um, he was assured that his uh, health insurance would be for a lifetime. For, I'm sorry, for the life of his wife as well, dual coverage. He died, and the new president came in and cut the wife out of the health insurance program. Yep, that stuff happens. All right, so future earnings are lost. Then there are expenses uh, like medical costs. Okay. I think I read somewhere that up, upwards of 90% of the cost of health care over a person's life occurs in the last three months of their life. Upwards of 90%. That's a lot. Okay. Of course, who, no one ever knows when the last three months will be. Okay. Healthcare medicine is so different from anything else we do. Okay? If someone says, what would you give me to extend the life of someone you care about by a month? What would you give me? Most people would say, well, how about everything that I have? It's different than anything else that we do. Other expenses, funeral expenses, which are very expensive, and then um, estate settlement costs. Okay? So the person is, has died and is gone, and the assets remain, and the lawyers, and the accountants, and the investment people, and the um, trust people, they're all taking fees. They're all taking fees. Okay. All right, so often, if you don't plan well enough, a premature death is going to cause uh, a problem with your family, your standard of living. Obviously, you have non-economic uh, costs. That goes without saying. All right. So, this is a biggie. Life expectancy has increased significantly over the last century due to breakthroughs in healthcare. So when you think about what's really changed in the world, um, 
Healthcare is one of the biggest changes we've had. Medicine. In the last 100 years, 150 years. Okay? The other is information and communications technology. Transportation technology. Those things have changed. Big. Okay? All right, since 1970, life expectancy has gone up 10%. Okay. All right, so people are living longer, which is a good thing. Not as many people die as young. So by the time people die, they have taken care of their financial obligations. Okay. If you're a man and you just celebrated your 79th year, you're beating the odds. You're beating the odds. Okay. And everybody says, oh, I know people that are 85, 90, 95, 100. Everybody has a relative who lived to 100. Yeah, but you also know people who died in high school. Car wrecks, things like that. Or cancer. All right. So, number one and number two. I don't know about stroke, but I know heart disease and cancer are huge. A lot of it is genetic, particularly this. Genetic. So, it's important for you to understand your background, your parents' background. Breast cancer is very genetic. Ovarian cancer, very genetic. Gotta watch that. Okay. So when do you buy life insurance? What justifies, motivates, or stimulates you to buy life insurance? If you have, if you make money, okay, so you're out of school and you're working, and others are dependent on that money. So if you're single, you don't plan to get married and have children, then the only money, the only insurance you need is funeral insurance. If you decide that I don't want to stick a $25,000 bill on anybody, I'll get a very small, either I'll buy a funeral policy or I'll get a small life insurance policy so that when I die, the only thing that's left is to pay for my funeral because there's nobody who needs anything that I have. I have a client who's pretty wealthy now, never got married, no kids, which is why he's wealthy. <laughs> and um, he, he listed his brothers, his brother and his two sisters as his beneficiaries on his investments. He don't, I don't know that he has life insurance. Can't remember, I'll have to look at my notes. He doesn't need it. All right. Okay, and again, just to make sure that we're redundant, then you're replacing the earnings. All right. Uh, you have to watch obesity, by the way. No, uh, I have some friends, a couple, and the guy was an athlete in high school, and a couple of years after he got out, and a couple of years after they got married, and he blew up. He blew up 350, 375 pounds. I mean, he was like that. He couldn't get life insurance. And when he was maybe 46 or 47, he went in to have um, a bleeding ulcer repaired. This happened about four or five years ago. And um, they opened him up, and he had a bleeding ulcer, but he was also full of cancer. And three weeks later, he died. And he had no life insurance because he was obese. Got to watch that. And he was obese because he, he had an eating disorder. He just ate. I mean, he didn't have he didn't have a physical reason to be obese. All right. Okay, different family types. 
You see this on the licensing exams, okay? And each type has different needs. So single people, all right? So my new client, both of his parents are gone. So he doesn't have to worry about aging parents. And his parents, while they were alive, he helped take care of them. Okay? But they also had their own assets. So when I say he helped take care of them, he didn't have to pay anything for them. But he made sure that they had moved into Harding Place and the children took care of, of taking turns coming to town and making sure that they were that their medicines were stocked up, that they had proper supervision at Harding Place, that they were they talked to all the doctors to make sure of what they needed to be aware of. Okay. All right. Single, do you have any other relatives? You know, you might have a, um, a nephew that has special needs that you might want to help fund, okay? You might be um, a key part of a, a, a key member of the team at a business, and if they lose you, it's really going to hurt the business. It's called key man insurance, okay? And then any charities that you might want to leave money to, okay? So when Harding, the development, the people, uh, or advancement people, whatever they call it now, it's fundraising. When they call on alums, they say, hey, do you have an insurance policy? Yeah, yeah, we do. Okay. How much is it for? What's a $5 million? Ooh, that's a pretty big policy. You think you could list, maybe throw $100,000 of that $5 million toward Harding? You know, yeah, sure. I'd be glad to do that. My kids might not like that a lot, but I'll do it. All right, single parent families with dependent children. Boy, does this happen a lot. Okay. Man, single parent families really struggle. The dad dies. That's the worst thing that can happen. Or dad abandons. That's a pretty bad thing, too. That happens a lot. Okay. And a you know, abandonment takes different forms. I know our society is different. I know people think more in terms of um, it's okay for a woman just to have a baby on her own, but it, it can cause some real financial problems, okay? And again, I would encourage anyone to think about um, the cost of having children and not putting that cost on the government. If you can't take care of a child from the get-go, you shouldn't have a child. You don't ask the government to do it. Now, if things are good and something bad happens, that's different. But don't go into it thinking, well, I'll just have the kid and, and, and get on Medicaid and food stamps and all. Please don't do that. If you cannot, if you cannot care for your family financially, before you get pregnant, please don't. Please don't do it. Wait until you can. Okay? That's just, that's just my advice. All right. Okay, two income earners with children. So you're going to have to cover both incomes unless one income, unless you're living below your means. Most people have two earners because they want to live a higher lifestyle. That's why both parents are working. Okay? You want a bigger house. You want nicer cars. You want the kids to go to private school. So they, you both have to work. Okay? And if you lose one of them, chances are pretty good you're not going to be able to maintain your lifestyle. So that's why you insure both of them. Okay? All right. Traditional family. One person's working, one person's at home, okay? And the child care provider dies. Let's say it's 1950, and, um, and Ward and June Cleaver, leave it to Beaver, okay? So June is at home taking care of uh, Beaver and Wally. Y'all ever watch Leave it to Beaver? Okay, Wally. Don't you love Eddie, right? Eddie Haskell, okay? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know who Eddie Haskell is? Maybe Leave it to Beaver, kind of. 
yeah, he's he's the kind of greasy, the slimy friend of Wally's who flirts with Mrs. Cleaver and she knows he's full of it, you know. So you don't you didn't grow up watching Leave the Beaver, did you? We'll have to turn you on to that. So um, you're gonna have to pay somebody, dad is gonna continue to work, okay? So dad's gonna have to pay somebody to come in and look after the kids. Okay? So June, you have to have coverage on June. Okay. All right, blended families. Okay. So you might have, so you get you have people who get divorced all the time, and they have kids, and then you bring the families together. And I had that happen in my own family. My parents were divorced when I was 14, and my dad married a woman who has three kids, and so, and there were four in our family, so there were seven kids. It was very interesting. So my dad died first, and then my stepmother died. And my stepmother was an anesthesiologist, and she made more money than my dad. But my dad did pretty well as, as well. But we were sitting around the table after, so when my dad died, everything went to my stepmother, okay? Which is typical, standard, you know. And then when my stepmother died, we're sitting around the table, and um, my, one of my sister-in-laws said, I don't even know why y'all are here. She's pointing to our side of the table, where me and my uh, two brothers and sisters are sitting, because Hill, your father, Hill L, he's dead. And this money is Faye's money, my stepmother. And so, Seth and Mark and Ann have a right to be here, to split it up, but y'all don't have a right to be here. And the lawyer said, oh, you are so wrong. And I looked at her and I said, I always knew that about you. <laughs> always knew that about you. Not a nice person. Not a nice person. And by the way, what would you do with uh, face jewelry? because she sold silver jewelry. And that's a fact. And I don't care, she can have it all. But she's, you know, that's how, who she was. Be careful when you're a planner, you need to be talking to people. You're gonna be advising people who are getting into this and you have to advise them, okay? If you're not careful, if you die, her kids or his kids might get your proceeds. Is that what you want? Okay. I don't know. You might look and say, okay, there are seven of you. One divided by seven is what each of you gets, 14%. Seems pretty fair to me. Okay. All right. Sandwich families, bad place to be. And that's when mom and dad are taking care of mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, at the same time that they're taking care of their own kids. Whoops. All right. So, as a financial planner, the first thing you do over coffee or lunch or breakfast is to find out the circumstances of the person you're dealing with. Okay? You need to know everything. How old are you? You know? How long you been married? How old is your wife or your spouse? How long you been working? Are you working? How, how strong is the company? How secure is your position, your skill set? How many kids do you have? All those things. Let's take a look at your budget. You, got, you need to see all those things in order to help somebody. All right, the amount of life insurance to own. How do you determine how much life insurance someone should have. Now if you ask an insurance agent that, what are they going to tell you? As much as possible. <laughs> Alright, three approaches to determine how much a person should own. Okay? The human life approach, the needs approach, and the last and the most conservative is the capital retention approach. Okay? And we'll look at each. So human life value approach. Okay. So the amount of insurance that you need depends 
on the, insur the insured's life value, and this is a present value calculation. Present value of the family's share. What that means is you look at dad's income. Let's say dad works and mom doesn't. We're back to 1950. Okay. Well, remember that dad, let's say dad makes $10,000 a month. Okay. And let's say um, the cost of living uh, is $9,000 a month. And let's say dad's costs are fifteen hundred bucks of that. Okay. Let's say you're a member of the country club, and mom and the kids don't use it, and dad has a boat. Mom and the kids don't use it. You know, dad eats a good bit. Okay. Blah blah blah. So what you have to do is, if dad's gone, those things go away too. All right. So the family share of the future earnings. Okay? That's what the calculation looks like. So we'll, we'll go over an example. Alright. So you're going to have to estimate the average annual earnings. And man, is that tough to do. Who knows? It depends on what field you're in. Okay? How long you plan to work? Most people plan to retire at 65. Okay? Somewhere between 62 and 68 is when the vast majority of people retire. Okay? All right. So you're taking taxes out of it, insurance out of it, and dad's maintenance costs out of it. Because you're really trying to fine tune. You don't want to overestimate it. Okay? You use a discount rate that you think you could earn if you had a relatively conservatively managed portfolio. Okay? And you find and you covered that amount until dad probably would retire. So, you know, if dad is 60 and dies, you don't go until age 85 to determine the amount of insurance you need for dad because dad was going to, told you he was going to retire in five years. Okay? Now dad should continue to get his retirement, depends on how, his pension, depends on how that's structured. Okay? That plays into it. Listen, if dad's 60, and has accumulated $2 million in his 401k plan, okay? And you do your calculations and you find that all you need is a million two to live off of. You don't need $2 million. You don't need life insurance, okay? So be, let's be straight about that. What happens is life insurance is supposed to cover premature death. And... So, from the time you have kids until the time your kids are no longer dependent and your wife is no longer 